Welcome to the Rosenbach Podcast. I'm your host, Alex Ames, Associate Curator of the Rosenbach Museum and Library in Philadelphia. This is Season 2, History Behind the Scenes, in which we explore the Rosenbach's remarkable historical, fine art, and decorative art collections, travel behind the scenes into the work of the institution to preserve its treasures, and engage in critical conversations about the place of rare books, libraries, and museums in modern-day American civic life. Today, we're going to learn more about how researchers come to the Rosenbach to make use of some of our lesser-known holdings in the fine and decorative arts, and discuss how you too can visit us to access our remarkable collections. Did you know that the Rosenbach Museum and Library is a global center for researchers who come from dozens of countries and across the United States to study our holdings? It's true. The reading room of the Rosenbach, where our researchers spend much of their time, is regularly buzzing with scholarly activity. Visiting researchers are important members of our community who help us learn more about the collection and who introduce new audiences around the world to our holdings. And the best thing about it is that anyone can be a Rosenbach researcher. Our collections are open and accessible for all to study, explore, and enjoy. In this episode of the Rosenbach podcast, I'm joined by a recent Rosenbach researcher who made a wonderful discovery about one of our fine art pieces, as well as two of my collections department colleagues who will tell us more about museum collections and research services at the Rosenbach. Heather Darcy is an historian and author of Anna of Cleves, The King's Beloved Sister, published 2019, as well as Children of the House of Cleves, Anna and Her Siblings, to be published in June 2023. Joby Zink is the Rosenbach's registrar who oversees our work in collection care and museum object cataloging. Jen Tanglau is the Rosenbach Collection's Stewardship Assistant, who is overseeing a major cataloging project designed to help us make our holdings more accessible, both online and in person. Heather, Joby, and Jen, thank you all so much for joining me for this conversation today. Hi, Alex. Thanks for having us here. Yeah, I'm really excited to be here. And Heather, it's so good to like see you again, even if you're not directly here with us. <laughs> Absolutely. It's a delight to be here with you. Heather, please introduce yourself to our podcast listeners and tell us a little bit about your work. My name is Heather Darcy. I am an author and historian. I predominantly work on Tudor adjacent figures. So I, I do a lot more with the Holy Roman Empire, or the Germans and people who are involved with the Tudor court. I have two books that are officially out. The first one is Anna, Duchess of Cleves, The King's Beloved Sister, and that, of course, on the cover features the Rosenbach portrait of Anna. That is available on Amazon or really any bookstore you would like. It can You can obtain it as hardback, paperback, or Kindle. I also self-published a novella called Diary of a Plague Doctor's Wife, it's set in 1720 Marseille when they had the last outbreak of plague. And it was something that I wrote, frankly, to help me deal with the pandemic, but I decided to finish it and self-publish it. So it's a quick read. It's a little bit of fiction. It's written as an actual diary. So if any of you pick that up, just keep that in mind. That's available on Amazon. And then finally, the next nonfiction book I have coming out is Children of the House of Cleves, Anna and Her Siblings. Right now it's available as hardback. You can order it through Amazon UK or other UK websites starting in June 2023 is when it will be released. You can pre-order it now. Otherwise, usually the US release is about three months after that. So I anticipate within the next few months, the pre-order for Children of the House of Cleves will be available on Amazon.com in the US. I also write and maintain maidensandmanuscripts.com. That's my blog. I have over 200 articles on there about history and women's history from the 16th century. If you'd like to find me, I'm on Facebook, not quite as often, but I'm there. Heather R. Darcy Historian on Twitter, at HR Darcy History. And on Instagram, I forgot that I had a middle initial, so I'm just at H Darcy 
history. And if I may, I do have a rather unique spelling to my last name of D-A-R-S-I-E. So if you're looking for me, just remember that spelling. I'm also the host of Hands-On History with the Tudor's Dynasty podcast, and an episode of that comes out roughly once a month. So who were the Tudors, and why do they matter? Why are they of interest to uh, people alive today? The Tudors became kings by conquest in 1485. The man who became Henry VII and was the founder of the Tudors dynasty overthrew Richard III and became king of England. And then his first son, Arthur Tudor, passed away at a young age. Henry VIII, his second son, became king in 1509. And Henry produced well, the first great Elizabeth, Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth I, who reigned from late 1558 until 1603. But also his children, Edward VI and Mary I, were fascinating monarchs in their own right. And Henry VIII kicked off the Reformation in England, which also greatly colored the reigns of his son and daughters. But part of the reason why I think they're so fascinating. So of course, Henry VIII is a slightly contentious, salacious character because he had six wives for various reasons. But also, in my opinion, what's really fascinating about them is when you look at portraiture, it becomes really, really detailed and much more photographic, if I can put it that way, during Henry's reign. He had a multitude of court artists, but perhaps one of the more famous is Hans Holbein, who took portraits of him and several of his queens and other personalities about court. And also you have people writing and the records are preserved and writing became more common. Also the printing press, of course, was introduced in a brown, I don't remember the exact year, but certainly in the in the mid to late 15th century and came over to England. So we have a lot more mass produced documents as well that still exist. So I feel like when we look at the Tudors, you have the introductory excitement of Henry VIII's marital intrigues. But then beyond that, they seem almost more like they're in a foreign country rather than that they've been gone for half a millennia. And I think that that's what's interesting about the Tudors and also why they're important is that we really have all these records and we can see their trajectory and also just the impact that they had on England and Scotland, which, of course, people from there came to North America and kicked off the United States. I'm really interested in a comment that you made earlier about how you're you're trying to take a perspective on this you know, well known uh, family dynasty and area of historical research by focusing on the connections to the Holy Roman Empire. Can you tell us more about how you discovered? And sort of, I guess, fell in love with this area of research and how you honed the particular approach that that you would that you would take uh, as you began your research and and writing career. This is a slightly silly story, but I suppose all great things must come from somewhere. Um, My dad, rest his soul, unfortunately, he's no longer with us, but he read a lot of history books and he knew a lot about history. And one day I said, Dad, do you know anything about the Wars of the Roses? And he said, no. And I said, what? Well, I'm going to read about it and then I'm going to tell you about it. And so that was my first really meaningful introduction to English history. And then, of course, the Wars of the Roses lead into Henry VII coming over. And then that, then there's the Tudor dynasty. And then you have Henry VIII and his six wives. And at the time, there had been a TV show on the Tudors. And that show, I think, was produced between... uh, I want to say 2007 and maybe 2010, but there was that show. So that's really what, what drew me into it. And then I think you asked something along the lines of how does my regular work influence how I approach my writing? And to me, it just, if you, if you sit back and you look at people's behavior and you and if you become familiar with literature of the time which is something that I like to do I like to read 16th century and earlier literature just to see how people think and you really look at what they're doing and you can kind of piece together a logical sequence of events because we have to remember and I think it's one of those maxims if I can put it that way that's often repeated is that the victor writes his is the one who writes the history Sometimes you have to look at the people who didn't succeed and kind of piece together the bits and see what makes the most sense. And that's something that I do for work is you have 
you have the plaintiff's side of what happened, the defendant's side of what happened, and the truth is somewhere in the middle. So I really do try to see all three sides, if I can put it that way, the, the, you know, the primary person of interest or the primary country of interest, the country that, that the secondary country or secondary person that's involved and then piece together what happened in the middle, if that makes sense. I find that really interesting and a wonderful reminder that even when we're doing sort of, you know, quote unquote, objective fact-based historical research, all of the tools and skills and, you know, psychological traits and personality traits that we have developed in our other lives can be, you know, actually quite useful and certainly tinge the shape that, that our work ends up taking. And it sounds like your career as an attorney, um, has shaped both the, the, the skills you you use as an historian and um, the, the the way that you conceptualize the work. Thank you. I, I try to do it that way. And frankly, I don't know that I would be able to sort another way to do it because it's just, not to sound cheesy, but so much ingrained in my nature at this point from having, from going to law school and then being an attorney for over a decade now. It's just how I how I think about things, I suppose. So tell me a little bit more about what inspired uh, your your interest in Anna, Duchess of Cleves, and your passion for researching her. And tell me what your findings have been in this research process. Quite frankly, after I became interested in the Tudors, I became a bit tired of reading that the only thing that was interesting about Anna was that Henry paid a pile of money, Henry VIII of England paid a pile of money to bring her over from Germany to marry her only to annul the marriage six months later because he found her to be ugly. And that just didn't make much sense to me because that seemed like an awful lot of effort to bring someone from a foreign country and then just abandon them. And that's really what kicked it off. And the the largest spark of interest, which by no means is highly intelligent, but I kept reading that her name was Anne, and that's not a German name. And so being an American and at the time less informed than I am now, I hadn't quite realized that when foreign brides came to England, their names were anglicized. So I sorted that her name probably wasn't actually Anne. And so I I wrote a letter to the mayor of the city of Cleves, explained who I was, what my hopes were, and asked for help. And that's what kicked it off. And to answer your question about things I've found out. I think the most exciting things that I've learned, I've discovered what I believe to be her true birthday of 28th June, 1515, not a September birthday. There's no basis for that. And also that in the Rosenbach's collection was a portrait that it was, its whereabouts were not quite known since about 1938 or 39 when one of the Rosenbach brothers acquired the painting um, after a auction in London, I believe. So tell me more about you know your your discovery of this Rosenbach portrait and what role it played in in your research. I mean, I'm assuming probably like like most historians and knowing the kind of work that that you do, I assume most of your sources are text based manuscripts, books, and that sort of thing. So here you have this portrait that is of interest to you. What was it like to? Um, discover this portrait here at the Rosenbach? How did you discover it? And what what was it like to come here and actually uh, do your research? So for to answer the question, I'll tell you how I first knew of it, how I was able to locate it, and then the process I went through to come to the Rosenbach and then my actual experience whilst there. So I was at St. John's College in Oxford, and I was investigating, I suppose you could say, or observing a, a portrait of Anna that they have there, and they gave me this binder of research. And in this binder was an article in the Burlington Magazine that mentioned the Rosenbach portrait of Anna, because we don't know who the artist is. I have a couple of ideas, and I did say Bartha Broin the Elder, but I am not an art historian. So, But I was looking at that, and it was in this article, it's right below or right above the Louvre or Hans Holbein famous three-quarter frontal view portrait of Anna, the engagement portrait. And you could just see the similarity. It's absolutely stunning. So I scanned the article. I came home and then I looked at it some more. I It says, I can't remember if it was Christie's or Sotheby's of London. I believe it was Christie's, but that would be the auction house that sold the portrait in right around 1938. So I phoned them, and they referred me to the New York office, who then referred me to a library, who referred me to the Rosenbach. So that's how I sorted where it was. And then I emailed and made contact with Joby Zink. And she's, for anyone 
wanting help with research. She's absolutely wonderful and she's extremely enthusiastic and also professional at the same time, which is a great combination. And she showed me the scan and uh, I was absolutely floored that it was still there. A few, that was in September, October of 2017. And then I made arrangements to physically go to the Rosenbach in February of 2018. And that was quite an interesting weekend to go because that was the the weekend that I went was when the Philadelphia Eagles were in the uh, Super Bowl. <laughs> but it was it was interesting getting there because the Rosenbach, of course, is two brownstones in a, re- a semi-residential area that had originally been owned by the brothers, if I remember correctly, and then donated to the city of Philadelphia upon their passing. So you're kind of in this strange area of Philadelphia where you wouldn't expect to have a treasure like the Rosenbach. So I went in there and Joby greeted me and Dr. Elizabeth, and forgive me, I've forgotten her last name, but they brought me all the notes to look at. I got to interact with the painting and I brought a magnifying glass, which I know sounds silly, but sometimes when you're up close to really any painting, whether it's modern or or classic or anything like that, it's incredible to see how much of a difference a single brush stroke can make. And I remember when I was looking at Anna's portrait that the Rosenbach holds, her arms kind of bent and there's one brush stroke of like a teal colored paint that creates a, the crook in her elbow. But it was it was a very easy process, very relaxed process, very professional and not intimidating whatsoever. Well, that's what we like to hear, <laughs> that, that the process of visiting us and making use of our collections uh, is, is relatively uh, painless and, and, and enjoyable for our researchers. So in a way, this is perhaps a sort of self-evident question, but I think it's worth asking. In the wonders of the digital age, you were, of course, able to see a, a photograph of the portrait before you arrived here on site. But I take it from what you're saying that it was very useful and meaningful for you to really get up close and experience the physicality, the materiality of this of this artifact. Is that a correct assessment? Absolutely. There are, I think in general with pieces of art, there are things that you do not take note of when you're simply looking at a scan, even if it's high resolution, versus going and interacting with the item. Uh, for example, there's a cut across the top of the painting from when it was transferred within the last few centuries onto the the board that it is on now, or perhaps even before then. I don't entirely know what the cut is, but I hadn't seen that before. Some of the details in her dress, her face, and and being able to remark upon some of the things that make her face um, unique in portraiture, so that if you're looking at other portraits of her, you can say, oh, hey, that must be Anna or, or someone that's closely related to her. So there is absolutely a strong value in going and interacting with the actual physical item, whether it's, in this case, the portrait of Anna, or if it's a document. So for anyone that's that's interested in doing historical work, it's I always recommend, if it is possible, to go and physically investigate the item of interest. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What role did this portrait actually end up playing in, in your research project, in your book project? How significant would you say you know, engaging with this artifact was to sort of the, the trajectory of your research? Extremely. Um, It was extremely important. And I realize that that might sound like I'm using superlatives, but keep in mind that this was a portrait that, of course, the Rosenbach knew where it was, but no one had quite introduced it to the public at large, if I can put it that way, in quite some time. And so to find that portrait, which I believe, I, I cannot prove, but my theory is that that portrait was sent ahead to England before Henry sent his ambassadors to look at Anna and her younger sister, Amalia, just to see that, be able to put that out there for the world to see, because of course that's the portrait that I had the honor of putting on the cover for Anna, Duchess of Cleves, the King's beloved sister. But also while researching her, when she first meets Henry's wider courts, not the initial meeting between them, but when she's meeting, meeting everyone out on the Blackheath, she's remarked upon as wearing a hat embroidered with pearls. And I have no way of knowing this for sure, but in the Rosenbach portrait, she's wearing a hat embroidered with pearls. And I can't imagine she had too many of those. So again, can't prove it, but I don't think it's erroneous to think that she could have been wearing that exact hat when she went to meet the the broader court and had her formal, formal first meeting with Henry. That's so amazing. And just goes to show that even for something like this particular portrait that, you know, one might assume is well understood, has been well-researched, deals with a well-known figure. Through your research, 
and studying of this object, placing it within context, you are able to bring so much more significance to the, to the piece, which, you know, you know, we perhaps didn't have on file. So this is the value that, that we uh, accrue as well from engaging with researchers who come and teach us about the objects. Absolutely. Now, one thing that I just admire so much about you is that you have a day job as a lawyer in Chicago and pursue your writing career on the side. And I, as you know, I, I have my day job here at the Rosenbach, I also like to write on the side uh, in my mornings, evenings, and weekends. And I suspect that there are probably listeners out there who either are writer, researchers and writers or perhaps aspire to pursuing projects along those lines. What tips do you have for listeners who might want to follow their dreams of pursuing scholarly and creative projects, whether it be writing or taking up a different kind of hobby that is some you know, fits somehow within the creative realm, but maybe they haven't yet developed a plan to do so. What tips would you provide? Commit to doing it, be bold, and try. And when it comes specifically to writing books, the, the way that I approach nonfiction is I break each chapter. Each chapter is a separate file effectively. And so I treat them each like a separate essay. And then once the document or once there's substantial amount done with those, then I turn it into a master document. But that's the easiest thing to do. So organize your work, nonfiction or fiction, if you're writing or whatever it is that you're pursuing, organize it into bite-sized chunks that don't intimidate you. And then that way you can work on each chunk at a time and it's much less daunting. Also, ask for help, ask for things. I mean, the worst thing that could have happened when I was able to get in touch with the Rosenbach is you guys could have told me no. Or for example, when I called Christie's of London, they could have told me no. And so just don't be afraid to ask and keep trying, keep trying. That's really interesting. As you say, there's no harm in asking, there's no harm in setting out and taking those first important steps toward achieving the goal that you seek. Have you found that your professional life as a lawyer shapes your approach to research and writing at all, or are they two completely separate parts of your personality, parts of your life? They go hand in hand quite well. Uh, one of the main roles as an attorney, or one of the things that people don't really see, and they certainly don't show on the television very often, is we do do a lot of research and we do a lot of thinking. And I know that that sounds silly, but that's how we put together our arguments and contemplate what's actually happening versus what is overtly happening on paper. So sometimes we have to dive into what was going on behind the scenes. And I think that that specific training and ongoing work experience was what helped me to see what was happening with Anna and not just what had been written down on paper. And my my bachelor's degree is in German languages and literature, so that's what allowed me to dive more into the German history and see how what was happening in Germany or the continent, if you will, was impacting or likely influencing how Henry and his ministers dealt with the, the problem of the Cleves marriage. So do you, and, and you, you can tell me, Heather, if you don't want this included on the podcast, but I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm so curious to know, is the balance right in your life that you have this robust career being an attorney and then this you know, robust career uh, and, and set of hobbies and interests as, as an historian and a writer? Have you found that you've been able to strike that right balance or do you find yourself sort of fantasizing about, man, I wish I could, you know, do, do the, the, the research and writing full time or, or, or how have you sort of landed uh, in your professional and scholarly life in terms of the, the balance you've been able to strike? Sheer force of will. That's entirely it. If I, could, if I could research and write all the time, I would be absolutely delighted to do that. But I've recognized a while ago that that's not realistic. And so frequently what happens is I pick away at something here and there. And also I have multiple projects lined up at once so that if I'm researching project A and I come across something that might work for project B, it flows in together. So that takes off some of the pressure. But quite frankly, it's a bit like being in college still because I get close to a deadline. I'm like, oh no, <laughs> whether that's at work or if it's um, with writing and then you know you have to put aside everything and concentrate on the project that's due. But also being an attorney, I have to think extremely precisely and quickly and accurately. 
And I think that that is probably one of the greatest skills I have been been able to bring into my researching and writing because everyone goes down rabbit holes, but I think I'm, I can tell very quickly when I'm going down a rabbit hole and can pull myself out of that. And every sentence that I write when I'm writing a book, I mean to write it. And I think very hard about how I'm constructing my sentences, where I'm placing my commas and making sure that my sentences make sense. So there's a couple different ways to write anything really. You can just, what I like to say, word vomit and just put all your ideas on paper and maybe you don't have the facts to back it up. So then you have to go find them. Or as you come upon your facts, you look at it, you absorb it, you think very carefully about how you're going to write it out. And then you do that. And it, and for me, I prefer to do it the second way because editing still has to happen and it's still extremely important. But if I can write a lucid, well thought sentence, paragraph, page, whatever it is, then there's much less effort and scrambling on the back end to perfect it. That's just really fascinating to hear. And I can say in, in my own experience, my own writing process that I have developed has really shifted since starting my career at the Rosenbach. Because of course, around here, you know, my colleagues in the collections department and I have to turn out text for exhibitions, for you know, promotional material, for podcast episode scripts, for all kinds of different Rosenbach sponsored projects very, very quickly. And I think before coming here, I I think I was a good writer, and I think I was an effective writer, but it, it was perhaps a, a slower process. And since coming here, I find that I write faster, and I am, I write much more precisely because you know there's always in my mind that necessity of you know keeping word count low to fit on an object label or an interpretive panel in an exhibition so yes i think that there's um you know, the, it's sort of this constant evolution of how we actually go about this work and i think it's actually quite exciting to bring other professional disciplinary perspectives to this uh, to this task i think so i think just and that's why going back to some of what we've spoken about anyone who wants to write a book you have a skill that could very well lead to a line of thinking about a topic that no one's really come upon before, at least hasn't expressed before. So just because you aren't a trained historian or a trained attorney or something like that doesn't mean that your research doesn't have value or that your thoughts don't have value. It's just sorting how to convey those ideas in a way that can be consumed by people and have meaning. And everybody can do that. They just have to, we each have to develop our own skill and way of conveying our thoughts to the world. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's really the, the, the question of finding your place in the market, you know, to be, to be crass about it. What's, what is your value added in this marketplace of ideas and what, you know, what special insights and skills and perspectives do you have that can, you know, contribute to, you know, the, the discussions on whatever topics you may be interested in. It's really inspiring. Thank you. I know that you are actually um, recording uh, our interview today from London, and we are recording this interview just a, a few days after the death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. And I'm wondering for you uh, what it is like to be in London on what I understand was a pre-planned you know, trip uh, to the United Kingdom at this immensely historic time, especially given your own interest and background in uh, the lives of you know, great royals of the past. Yes. I planned this trip, I think, in July. And on Thursday, I was talking with my friends and loved ones with whom I'm staying about the Queen's passing, which I am, of course, quite American. You can hear by my speech. But it's sad to me. She, in some ways, she was an excellent example of steadfastness, even temper, and just a great example of a, of a leader and of a woman. And in some ways, I don't know if this is correct or not, but part of the way that I see her is as being the grandmother of a country, and she's gone now. The My flight to London, I came in on Friday the 9th. That wasn't busy whatsoever, but when I landed at Heathrow, it was late at night. It was about 10 o'clock at night, but there was a sign up that it was a mark of condolences from Heathrow to the royal family upon the passing of the Queen. And then Saturday morning, I watched live the accession activity of Charles III. I've been very fortunate to physically be here to see it while it's happening live as opposed to seeing clips of it later. And then 
Sunday, I was up and about town and there were different things. A lot of the billboards, especially the digital ones, are blacked out with remembrances for the queen rather than advertisements. And yesterday I went to, yesterday being Monday the 12th, I went to Stonehenge and Bath and there are a lot of tributes there. There were several flowers laid in a garden right on the River Avon in Bath by, frankly, by where the coach buses go. But there are a lot of flowers there and they were allowing people into that park without having to pay. So a lot of things that are normally somewhat off limits to the public or at least require fee to enter appear to be open. The, I think they did a... I don't know if they did the full 96 gun salute from Stonehenge, but they apparently did do a gun salute from Stonehenge. I wasn't there for that, but that is a thing that happened. For the most part, it's an outpouring of grief. I mean, this evening I was sitting with my, my English or British loved ones on the couch and we were watching the Queen being transported from Balmoral to Buckingham Palace. Actually, that just finished up right before you and I started recording this. And there's definitely a sense of sadness. And even for people who aren't monarchists, they they seem to understand well of course they understand but there is a, a, a national sorrow there are a few upstarts here and there um one thing that is unfortunate is i feel like whenever a big moment happens you have people willing to spoil it but ultimately what we're seeing is a family you know a human family the royal family are, are all human watching or trying to deal with the very public death of their beloved grandmother and a country and perhaps part of the world trying to deal with this extremely massive change in in how to understand the world if that makes sense because she's been around for so so long charles the third i've been impressed with we're seeing much more of his personality which has been good and he has done an excellent job in my opinion not being any type of a politician or stateswoman or anything like that but he promptly went to scotland well he was in scotland came down to London. He was in Northern Ireland earlier today, I believe, or might have been yesterday morning. I'm a little hazy on that, but he's now back in London and he's been going out, mingling with the people, showing himself and also showing his personality, which has been nice. But I'm hoping on Thursday to have an opportunity to attempt to queue and go into Westminster Hall to pay my respects if I'm fortunate enough and quite frankly, if the line is forgiving enough. How omnipresent as you're going around to various sites and cities and locations in the United Kingdom, how omnipresent is this public grief? I mean, is is it the sort of thing where, you know, obviously everyone knows the news and it's being discussed and obviously on the front page of newspapers, on the billboards, but would you say it, it extends beyond that to the point that there's sort of something palpable in the air? Uh, give, give me a sense of just how momentous an occasion uh, this has been in the last few days? I think more what it is, is the volume of people, including myself, who cried over it. I mean, even for just a tear or two, just how much it's impacted people. It's the, the feeling, in my estimation, is palpable in London. Maybe not all corners of it, but London seems a bit quieter, and not just in the poetic sense, or at least until when I was up there on Sunday, there wasn't quite as much traffic. When I was at Stonehenge, that's I think that it was something everybody was quietly aware of, but it wasn't overt. In Bath, you would see, which is that to give people a sense, it takes about two and a half hours, two, two and a half hours to get from London to Bath, which is west of London. And that's as far outside of London that I've gotten while I've been here this time. But there were the blacked out advertisements in honor of the Queen, and there were flowers in the garden that I went to yesterday. So it really is all over the country. It's not just people, or in my estimation, it appears to be all over the country. It's not just people queuing up in London and leaving things at Buckingham Palace or at Balmoral or Windsor. And in fact, when I went into Bath Abbey yesterday, I walked in and shortly after that, the, I don't know if she's a pastor or preacher. I'm very sorry. I don't know the proper term, but the ecclesiastical figure, we'll put it that way gave a speech about Elizabeth and there were prayers for her and everyone that was in there was welcome to take part in that. And that was, I mean, that was kind of a random time in the afternoon. I think that that happened at two, two or two 30 in the afternoon. So I don't know that there's a normally scheduled service at that time. So I'm slightly under the impression that to help the nation and the people who are present in this nation mourn, there's probably more, spiritual guidance than there would be on a typical day. 
What is your status as someone who researches other queens and royals influence the reaction that you're having to this um, at all, would you say? I don't know that I can answer that properly about myself, but it wouldn't surprise me if it was. I don't know that my comprehension of the magnitude of what has happened is that different from someone else because ultimately sorrow is sorrow. I'd say that the biggest thing that happened was when I was chatting with some of my friends, we were talking about how Queen Elizabeth had to lie in state. And part of the purpose of that was, in my estimation, to prove that she was dead and to prove that King Charles really does have the right and the way to be the king and not just the prince regent. And that's something that goes back to ancient times or or certainly, you know, medieval Renaissance times, just proving that the monarch is dead and the way that you do that is a lie in state. Thank you so much, Heather, for telling me about your research at the Rosenbach. Now for some context, I'd like to turn to Joby Zink, the registrar of the Rosenbach, who can help us understand the scope of the Rosenbach's fine and decorative art holdings and our research services. Joby, as Heather just told us, she was drawn to the Rosenbach to study a portrait. How extensive is the Rosenbach's collection of fine and decorative art, and what are some strengths in these areas? How do these collecting areas connect to our book and manuscript collections. Thank you so much for asking that question, Alex. Um, Can you believe that we actually have 15,154 pieces of fine and decorative arts cataloged in our collections management database? Wow, I never would have guessed that large of a figure, honestly. Right, so that actually includes things from furniture and furnishings, the silver, the sculpture that you'll see on top of bookcases um, on the third floor, as well as the porcelain and china that belong to the Rosenbach brothers and the Gratz family. There's also, oh gosh, thousands of prints and drawings, prints in various states of completion. And then, of course, paintings. Um, we have a huge number of paintings, and I almost did not include all the material culture objects that were collected by Marianne Moore that make up quite a bit of our holdings. So I would say that some of our strengths are our portrait miniatures. We have 505 portrait miniatures. 450 of them are from one collection from Talbot Hughes. Philip purchased it in 1928. And the majority of them are oil on copper rather than oil on ivory. So it's rather unique and stunning and important by the number of people and the names of the people who are depicted in these portrait miniatures. Can you explain, I mean, in in a way, the the term portrait miniature is self-explanatory, but for (laughs) listeners who may not have seen a portrait miniature before, can you just give us a sense of what they look like and how they would have been worn and used? Sure. Um, I'm going to say it's probably about three, four inches. Um, Most of them are oval in shape and have beautiful decorative metal, whether it's gold or silver or some other metal, um, casing with a nice little glass concave cover over it to protect these minute, like they are very small, very detailed. Um, I guess the easiest thing for me to think about is like the Dutch masters, Mm -hmm. like all of those paintings that are really tiny and detailed. So you're using very thin brushes Mm -hmm. to um, create these. And it's something that people of means who could afford this sort of artwork would perhaps wear on their person as a necklace or some other accoutrement on their body uh, to remind them of a person they love, perhaps someone who had died or perhaps someone who is still alive. Right. So a lot of them are um, people of, royal connections or military connections. I think one of my favorite is um, a self-portrait done by John Andre, the major from um, British Army um, Revolutionary War time that he painted while he was actually in prison. Wow. Here in Phil- not in Philadelphia, but in Pennsylvania. And how do all of these materials that you're describing connect to our book and manuscript collections here at the Rosenbach? That is a great question, Alex. Really, the three-dimensional collections allow us um, an increased level of accessibility to our books because a book can only be opened up at one page opening. But we have 
art and prints and drawings and paintings that allow you to step into that literary work and see what the author is describing, or it presents the figure that is being described. Joby, do we re- receive a lot of inquiries from researchers about our fine and decorative art collections? And what kinds of topics do people uh, pursue when they come to make use of these materials here at the Rosenbach? I actually crunch the numbers um, because I do collect the research query statistics. And 10% of our annual research queries are related directly to our fine and decorative arts collections. Um, And the questions are frequently about attribution. If it's a print, they want to know about the state of it. Is it, does it include the inscription? Um, And then people come in to like look up close at those portrait miniatures that we've been talking about. Researchers are coming in to study our paintings. They are by renowned artists. They're, you know, the portraits of Gilbert by Gilbert Stewart and Thomas Sully. The, at least one of the paintings in the dining room is attributed to the American painter from the Philadelphia area, Benjamin West. We've got prints and drawings, prints by Jean-Baptiste Le Prince, and we've got drawings by Fragonard and Girolamo de Carpi that are exquisite. And people come in to get their eyes right on top of them and study the nuances of the drawings, examine the back of those portrait miniatures. Um, I know that there's a portrait miniature by Sofonispa Angeloso, um, famous Italian Renaissance artist, female. Um, and that's always a, a work of art that people are very excited to see up close. We also even have a portrait miniature attributed to El Greco that toured and went to Spain. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, that information, Joby, about just how expansive our holdings in this area are. And I have to tell you that I was at an event not too terribly long ago with the newly appointed director of the Hispanic Society of America. And I mentioned that I'm at the Rosenbach and his immediate response was, I know that El Greco (laughs) at the Rosenbach. So, So these pieces do have recognition and impact in the wider world. Oh my gosh, do you know who I totally forgot to mention? Who? <laughs> it's John Tenniel, who did the um, original illustrations. Well, actually, not the original illustrations, because um, Lewis Carroll did his own original illustrations, but he didn't like his works. So he had John Tenniel illustrate um, Alice's Adventures Underground, and we mm-hmm. have those drawings, mm-hmm. like 50 of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which maybe are closely associated with our, our literary holdings, but actually are fine, fine decorative art material Correct. in terms of the, the way that they need to be stored and cared for. So that's really, really interesting. Another point I wanted to make, building on a comment that you, you made earlier, Joby, is the idea of how fine and decorative art collections allow us different ro- pathways into the, the text-based objects like rare books and manuscripts. For any visitor who has been to the Rosenbach to see our um, exhibition, 18 Reasons to Read Ulysses, uh, you will know that as important as the Ulysses manuscript, of course, is in that gallery installation, um, it is the fine and decorative arts that light the space up and make it very accessible, make it visually interesting, especially for general audiences. Oh, absolutely. We have, um, it's a recent acquisition of 101 paintings by um, an artist named Heather Ryan Kelly. And um, I think that those paintings, while they're very small and intimate, they're eight by 10 for the most part. Some of them are nine by 12. Um, So much larger than the portrait miniatures, but still very intimate but they allow you to visually access that text that is so dense that made me want to tear up my hair the first time I started mm-hmm. trying to read it. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it really helps give you an entryway into um, Ulysses. And yeah, it's yeah. And you know, the Ulysses manuscript is unquestionably one of our great treasures, but in terms of visual interest, you see one page of the manuscript, you sort of seen them all. There with, you know, there's important variation, obviously, but in terms of exhibition material, having decorative arts and fine art to, to sort of wrap around 
the Ulysses manuscript is extremely important. So the, the, the decorative art and fine art collections of the Rosenbach both enhance our status as a research institution mm -hmm. and as a public interpretation site for members of our community to come and learn about um, history, art, and culture. My final question for you, Joby, is one that we've sort of already addressed in our conversation thus far, but I'll, I'll pose it to you nonetheless. Why are the Rosenbach's fine and decorative art holdings important? How do they help us achieve our organizational mission? I'd say that our fine and decorative arts collections really set us aside from other traditional rare book libraries. It's something we should be proud of. It's right there in our name, Rosenbach Museum and Library. And it's amazing because our collections, when you walk into our historic house, you are walking into the home of the Rosenbach brothers. You're getting a sense of their collecting, their sense of pride, their sense of family. It's a showcase of all that was important to them. And you, you really get that on the first floor before you go up to the third floor where you see the libraries. And so much of the art and the furnishings are related to the works that are um, behind the cases upstairs in the library. Thanks so much for this context, Joby. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Jen Tanglau, the Rosenbach's Collections Stewardship Assistant, who is working on an exciting project relating to our online museum collections catalog. Jen, I'm just sure that some listeners out there are curious about how they can learn more about the Rosenbach's object collections. Can you give listeners an introduction as to how they can go about searching our holdings of fine and decorative art in particular? Sure, and thanks for the introduction, Alex. The best way to learn more about our collections, I would say, um, is to visit our website at rosenbach.org slash collections. This landing page is a great summary of some of our collection highlights. If you'd like to learn more about what we have in our collections, you can also review the different categories we have of our objects um, by going to the collections drop-down menu at the top of our page. Joby gave us a great introduction of what we have in our collections. Um, on the website specifically, um, it'll categorize it under fine art, furniture, lighting, textiles, jewelry and virtu, metals, ceramics and glass, and portrait miniatures. Each of those sections have a really nice overview of that category and features specific objects as well. I will say, if you want to go even deeper into our collection, um, I suggest you visit the catalogs, databases, and collection guides section of our website. You can search Phil, which is our online collections database, and this contains catalog records for the majority of our non-library objects, including the fine decorative arts I mentioned earlier, and our Marianne Moore collection too. I also think um, your listeners will be interested to hear that we recently updated Phil to include abbreviated versions of most of our library holdings as well. This has been a really exciting endeavor for our librarian, Elizabeth Fuller, and our assistant librarian, Nancy Loy, who have been working really hard on it. Having our library holdings and fill is really just a stopgap measure um, until we have our online library catalog up and running, which is a long-term project in the making. But we're really glad to have this data accessible for the public in the meantime. Thanks for giving us that overview of how to learn more about the collection. And I'm wondering if you can tell our listeners a bit more about the cataloging project on which you are working. Sure. So my role at the Rosenbach is grant funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. And this project is mainly focused on preparing the existing data in our collections management system, PassPerfect 5.0, and we're migrating it to PassPerfect Web Edition. So essentially this means that our collection management system will be from a server-based system to a cloud-based system which not only makes it more accessible and efficient for our staff to use, but it also instantly updates the changes we make to our collection records in PassPerfect to our fill catalog. While we're preparing this data for migration, we're also gonna be using this opportunity to clean up our data, um, our records, so that the data is more standardized and therefore easier for staff to use, but also for the public to access for search and discovery purposes. I also wanna mention that in addition to this data project, we're also, as a department, our collections department, are in the beginning stages of addressing potentially harmful and insensitive content within our catalog records. This may include descriptions, images, titles, and subject headings that have outdated language um, or professional practices um, that were insensitive that may reflect attitudes and opinions that were acceptable in the past but are not any anymore. 
So we know this type of reparative cataloging is absolutely necessary and important, and we're in the process of researching how to best remediate these instances of harmful content in our catalog records. We have a separate episode, I believe, Alex, Mm -hmm. um, on our reparative cataloging project, so check that out. Thanks for telling us more about that important cataloging work, Jen. And I think it's just so vital for listeners um, to, to have this glimpse sort of behind the curtain of how the machinery of a library and museum operates, because we're, we're all so accustomed nowadays to being able to search things online, get most information you need from digital sources. But, you know, as a museum and library with collections, you know, spanning from the ancient world through the Middle Ages, through the 18th and 19th centuries into the 20th century, we deal with analog materials, material artifacts. And it is by virtue of the work, especially of the collections department, that these items become discoverable online. Mm -hmm. And at a comparatively small institution, guess who's doing that work? It's the three of us, (laughs) our our colleagues, Judy, Elizabeth, and Nancy, and, and, and other consultants and our other colleagues as well at the Rosenbach who help raise money and create the institutional climate that supports these sorts of efforts. So, um, you know, it, it is through these digital projects that we are able to make sure that all of the spectacular collections that you and Joby have described become widely accessible and discoverable to our community. Mm-hmm. Now, all of that being said, you know, it certainly is true that um, it can take some effort to dive into any database, any online database at any museum and library around the world, um, and, and really find objects that you're looking for. Mm-hmm. And so I'm wondering, Jen, if you have any tips for how listeners, for how our researchers can make best use of our online search tools. You know, the, the, the structure of a relational database isn't just like Google. You don't just go and search for a keyword and expect a, you know, a gazillion perfect results to show mm-hmm. up. What should our researchers be bearing in mind when they are going into a catalog uh, and looking for, for either something in particular or interested in sort of researching a, a concept or a time period or what have you? So I do have a few tips. Um, my approach to any museum collections database in general is to start broad for what you're looking for and then narrow down your search parameters. This helps me get a feel for how an institution's online collection search works. And if you don't have much information on the types of objects you're looking for offhand, I would suggest that you do a little bit of research to find those context clues before jumping into the collection search page. So for our fill catalog, depending on how much contextual information you have ready, you can use either the keyword search or the advanced search. So if you have somewhat of an idea of what you're looking for, such as subject matter or artist, but you don't have much more than that, I would start off with the general keyword search. If you do have more detailed information about objects you're looking for, you can use the advanced search option, where you can include a combination of information, such as artist name, medium title, things like that. Just be careful not to add too many parameters as that can often lead to the dreaded no results found notification. So it's definitely a fine balance between um, how many filters you include. In advanced search, um, one tip that I like to use is um, the description field. I like to use that as like a keyword search. So fill in any descriptive words, phrases, or contextual information that you think would be helpful in narrowing down your search results. And another thing to be mindful of um, is the variations in spellings, hyphens, and um, the spaces you enter in between words. If you're unable to find something, double check the data you entered and um, try to do different spelling variations also, that might be helpful. Generally speaking, I would say that when it comes to museums search tools, it takes a lot of time and patience um, to find what you're looking for. It can be really frustrating at times too. Um, So just give yourself some grace. And um, if you have any trouble, please do contact our staff because we're always happy to help. And that's a perfect segue to the final question of the interview, uh, which I'm going to direct to Joby. Joby, how can listeners who are curious to learn more about our holdings, and and maybe they don't yet have a specific research query in mind, but they perhaps didn't know about this area of our collecting, interested in learning more, interested in getting a sense of the, the, the broader categories in which we collect, how can they reach out to uh, the Rosenbach staff to make inquiries and maybe even set up a research visit. The best way to find out more about our collection is to continue poking around our website. I know Jen talked about how to find and search our database, but we also have collections guides 
that will narrow it down by author and sometimes themes such as um, vampire literature. And also I, I suggest poking around on our blog um, because that really gives a little bit more of our personality and like the weird and wonderful things that we come across on a daily basis. Um, you know, we are researchers ourselves here. We find something in our collection and we start going down a little rabbit hole and write you a little blog post about it. So that's a great way to find things. It's probably best to go ahead and submit in a collections inquiry rather than reaching out to us directly, mostly because we track our queries. And if you write to us directly, we'll happily answer it, but we're going to have to send it up a chain and go through a whole process. So just go to the make a collections inquiry or make an appointment tabs under research. And there's also a third tab about images and permissions, um, because you might see something as you're poking around on our database that you want to use for your publications or your study, and you can submit your image request there too. Even if you don't know what your topic is, you can say, send a message and say, hi, I'm Joby, and my favorite sidebar thing to search about is fakes and forgeries. Do you have any forgeries in your collection? You're not going to come up with that way on a search usually, but you know, send that question in and that's a great way to ask and find out. Well, thank you, Joby, for that information. And one thing I can say about the Rosenbach staff is that we are a busy bunch, but we are an enthusiastic bunch and we're always happy to engage with members of our community who are interested in learning more about, as you say, the weird and wonderful objects that comprise our world-renowned collection of fine and decorative arts, material culture, rare books, and manuscripts. Thank you very much, Heather, Joby, and Jen, for this fascinating discussion. I've enjoyed learning more about how Rosenbach researchers help our collections come to life in exciting new ways. You're welcome, Alex. It was a great time talking to you. Yes, thank you, Alex. I had a lot of fun. Yeah, thank you. And it's so fun to like reconnect with, you know, researchers from years ago mm -hmm. and hear how everyone's doing. Mm -hmm. we, we truly are a family here at the Rosenbach, <laughs> a collections-based family of scholars and the curious who, who love, who love our holdings. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Rosenbach Podcast. Check back soon for another glimpse into the Rosenbach Museum and Library's remarkable collection of rare books, manuscripts, art, and artifacts, and for more fascinating conversations about history, art, and culture. To learn more about the Rosenbach, visit rosenbach.org. We host a variety of on-site and online events and public programs, and always welcome questions from listeners about how to use our collections. Our holdings are always accessible to researchers who make a free appointment to visit our reading room. The Rosenbach's community reaches all around the globe, brought together by our love for history, rare books, manuscripts, and the arts. I hope you will consider supporting the Rosenbach Museum and Library and this podcast by becoming a member today. It's one of the best ways to help us with projects like this. Membership start at just $55 and give you access to everything we have to offer, online and in person. If you cannot make a financial contribution, please give our podcast a good rating on Apple Podcast or wherever you listen to help us build our audience. The theme music for season two of the podcast is a setting of the poem Longings, written by poet, artist, and educator Nellie Rathbone Bright in 1927. Bright co-founded the Black Opals, a collective and literary journal showcasing young Black writers in Philadelphia in the late 1920s. The musical version featured here was performed by Yolanda Wisher, Paul Geis, V. Shane Frederick, Mark Anthony Palacio, and Sir Lance Gamble. I want to flee to a cool the Rosenbach Podcast is supported by a grant from the Evelyn Toll Family Foundation. Thanks again, and I look forward to continuing our conversation about history on the next episode of the Rosenbach Podcast. In the heart of me, drums in my ears, and my lips 
are wet with the tang of the sea.